it's it's not just the setting, though the setting is a huge part of it. it it's going to affect, uh, you want to create a world that would have produced the characters you want to write about. And in science fiction and fantasy, uh, that's particularly important. But it's there's world building in every kind of fiction, whether you're building um, a fictional county or town or whatever for a mystery or historical novel or something, or whether you're setting it in a real place, that's still world building. What is up, everybody? You're listening to episode 56 of SFF Addicts. I'm your host, Adrian M. Gibson, and welcome to your weekly dive into the world of science fiction, fantasy, and writing craft. Joining me as always is my co-host, the Chewy to my Han Solo, the Joker to my Commander Shepard, my dear MJ Kuhn. How are you, MJ? Hello, hello. I'm doing well. How are you, Adrian? I'm good. And MJ's the author of Among Thieves, because it's like, I'm going to do that from now on. So. You're just going to hawk my book every episode now. <laughs> Why not? Why not? For anyone watching in video, if not, go pick up Among Thieves. Anyways, <laughs> a quick note for anyone listening out there or watching, the official SFF Addicts Patreon and merch store are live, so check the links in the description to support what we do here. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast app, and subscribe to the FanFiatic YouTube channel, where this and every other episode of the show is available in full video. And now, Joining us once again is none other than Martha Wells, author of the Murderbot series, Witch King, and more. Welcome back, Martha. How are you? Oh, thank you. I'm fine. <laughs> Glad you're doing well. A heads up for anyone out there listening or watching. This is part two of our two-part chat with Martha. So I recommend checking out part one to get to know her better. Today, we're getting a lay of the land, doing a mini masterclass on World Building 101. So just to dive right into the wonderful world of World Building Essentials. What does world building mean to you, Martha? And do you remember the first fictional world that really swept you off your feet? Um, yeah, um, the first fictional world, um, uh, the one that I didn't create was probably um, Monster Island from the Godzilla movies. There was a cartoon <laughs> with the family living on the island and uh, I think King Kong was their friend. And yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> And that's probably the first fantasy world I really got into. Um, I also really loved Land of the Giants for some reason. I, uh, a it, thing for giant monsters. <laughs> giant thing for giant monsters, and it's it was uh, it was a good show. I will I will I've never I haven't seen it in uh, probably forty five years, but you know I will defend it. Yeah, um, <laughs> the world building in that show. Um, the one, the first one I created was for the element of fire, which was, I'd mentioned the last episode, uh, my early fantasy was very ba based on its secondary world, but based on historical time periods. And I was a huge fan of um, Richard Lester's Three Musketeers and Four Musketeers. And a lot of my friends also were into it at the time when I was in college. Um, and so I, a fantasy version of that was kind of what I was going for. So I did a lot of research on, um, that time period, uh, 17th century France. And, um, and that was my first, uh, you know, my first probably love as a fantasy world that I created. Um, and what world building means to me, it's just the, um, it's it's not just the setting though. The setting is a huge part of it. It it's going to affect. Uh, you want to create a world that would have produced the characters you want to write about, and in science fiction and fantasy, uh, that's particularly important. But it's there's world building in every kind of fiction, whether you're building um, a fictional county or town or whatever for a mystery or historical novel or something, or whether you're setting it in a real place, that's still world building. Yeah. And just to go back to Monster Island for a second, what about it was like so entrancing for you? Like why do you, obviously like King Kong is amazing, but like, <laughs> majestic. <laughs> yeah. But like, what was it so captive? What was so captivating about that, that world and, and, and the people that were living there? Well, one thing you have to think about is the fact that 
you know, there were only five channels and only one of them was showing anything like <laughs> science fiction and fantasy was showing the, the independent station would show monster movies and scary movies and old, you know, uh, Abbott and Costello and all that kind of stuff, anything cheap, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I really liked, I, my sister was nine years older than me and we lived in, even though my cousins didn't live that far away, um, I was on a very kind of isolated street because I was at, and we were in a busy street that, that, um, so my parents didn't want me to go anywhere and there weren't any other kids on that street. So I was really lonely as a kid. So I was always gravitating toward stories with big families or, um, where kids lived with their friends somehow or whatever kids in groups. And that's what that had. So that would have attracted me. And, um, just there was a lot of freedom of living on an island and you could go, I mean, you had monsters obviously, so that was an issue, but you could, you could run around and do all these things. A minor challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and I was kind of stuck in my room or in my backyard a lot. So just being able to, as a kid, see people being able to go around and go places and do things, you know, often without any adults was kind of a big thing for me. Yeah, it's like where the wild that. things are. Like, let's just get yeah. on a boat and just sail yeah. around, man. Yes. Just brought back core memories for me, Adrian. That's what I do. <laughs> so I want to kind of dive a little deeper into something that I feel like um, that you touched on a little bit, which is the you know the fact that world building is more than just setting and the world building. Yeah, we think about it mostly with you know second world fantasy and science fiction, space opera stuff like that, but it does exist in in fiction in general. Um, I just kind of want to dive a little deeper into what makes crafting a, a realistic, robust feeling world so important to storytelling, in your opinion. Oh, I think it's it's part of the suspension of disbelief. It's part of what we come to science fiction and fantasy for is stepping into another world. It's not just... Um, it's not just an exciting space story or a s exciting fancy adventure. It's that feeling of being somewhere else, of just being removed from reality. And there's all the stuff of, you know, you can use, obviously you can use science fiction fantasy to reflect reality and get people to think about it in different ways. And that's important. But that constructing that reality, I think, is an important part of getting people to suspend their disbelief and accept the fantasy and the magic. And, and that's always been a, a, a part of it. Like you'll notice with early books, uh, early fantasy, like uh, E.R. Edison's The Wormer Roboros, there has to be an explanation at the beginning of how the characters got or how, how this person got this narrative. You know, that was kind of the conceit. It's like, how I, an Earth person, know what happens on this other planet in order to tell you this. <laughs> right. And it's, and we've got past that point. We don't Thanks have to, it. we know there's, it's someone writing a book. It's like they made it up out of their head. We don't need to hear about that it might be a true thing or whatever. You know, it's like, we don't, we don't, no one's going to buy that now. Uh, <laughs> so we, we can just start. And so um, I think the audience now has, the audience is more accustomed to being told, okay, you're, you're opening this book. It's in a fantasy world. Go, you know, you don't have to justify it or anything. I'm very glad we've got past that point. Yeah. That sounds <laughs> ridiculous. It's like, Hey, breaking the fourth wall for a minute. You know, <laughs> I'm like a, no, like a Xeno journalist baby. And I'm just happy to write a book about like yes. some fantasy. Yes. Like, this is so ridiculous. That's, that's a lot of what they're, that those introductions feel like. Oh man, that's ridiculous. I love it though. I love it. <laughs> and you mentioned, you mentioned earlier, it's like, I think this is a really cool point. It's like creating worlds, not just a setting, but like crafting a world that works for the characters that you want to be in your story. It's like you create a world that, that creates the characters essentially. It's like this character wouldn't exist without the world that they, they live in and without like the broader context of things. So for you, how is world building this sort of like linchpin in the sort of uh crafting fabric of of writing that affects a broader stories whether it's like characters or plot or different elements how is it a linchpin in 
all the other elements, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think because all the other elements really depend on it. Um, we just, you know, we talked about character. Um, it has to be the kind of place that would have produced this character. Um, what's available in the world and what the characters have access to really help define your plot. Um, and you can set yourself, I mean, you're, you're creating everything. So it sounds like it would be easy to come up with, yeah. you know, these <laughs> interesting problems for your characters. But, uh, um, I think it, it helps you generate the, the um, the kind of material culture your characters are going to have access to that's going to affect what they do and how they get out of situations and just, you know, even just the very basic question of do they, is, does magic exist in this world and can they do magic and how hard it is, all that affects the plot so much because you don't want to make things too easy, but you don't want to, um, you know, I think most writers, especially me, have written themselves into corners where suddenly you end up in a situation and you're <laughs> like, I have set this up so these people can't get out of this. <laughs> I need to back up. And then, you know, I'm looking, looking at different ways and realizing, oh, but I forgot about this thing. Yeah. And that's going to affect stuff. And suddenly it opens up a whole lot of realm of possibilities. So it's just like you're, it's like you're, you're working on a puzzle but you you created the pieces, <laughs> I so love that. Um, um, it's just a lot of fun to do. It's a lot. Well, I should say it's a lot of fun when it works right. Yes. <laughs> when you're sitting there banging your head against the wall, going, you know, um, I I did a thing with Death of a Necromancer. Originally, I planned they were going to get stuck, have to run into this prison to get away from the people and, and, and things that were trying to kill them. And then they were going to leave the balloon from the roof, which sounds like a good idea in the abstract. And then I'm sitting there going, this is stupid. Um, it doesn't work. It doesn't work in this world, you know? And I even had like, put the balloon, how are they going to get it? They have to go back to the house. You know, it was just like, it was just like, <laughs> who knows? No, this is not working. Um, and so that kind of, and then the, what I came up with of working their way out of the building, I thought, well, this is a lot more interesting and it's been a lot and it makes a lot more sense. Um, and it gets, it, I think it probably, it's probably different for different writers who plan out a lot more in advance. I, I'm not really good at outlining. I have a lot of trouble trouble visualizing for example an action scene and how all these pieces are going to work unless i'm actually writing it some people can do that in an outline and, and outline all this stuff in advance and really you know have it all worked out and i can't i can't do that i have to just kind of start trying to write the scene and i'll think of so many things while i'm writing that i would not have been able to come up with just trying to outline so it works a lot better for me That's yeah cool. I love that. Well, and it's, it, I felt like for, for listeners of the show that have listened to the, I'm, I'm pretty infamously a aggressive plotter. Um, but that does still happen to me too. Like I, I plot my stuff to death, but there are times when you get to the writing process and you're like, well, shit, this really looks like it was going to work. But now that I'm actually in the, you know, the meat and potatoes of what's happening here, mm -hmm. this is not going to land. And then you do yeah. have to course correct. Your insert um, action scene or insert chase scene did not work here. I yeah. do, do yeah. not. <laughs> like, I'll just deal with this later. I'll write it another time. They, they escape somehow. Um, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> on the terms of the nuts and bolts and like kind of the nitty gritty, the how, right, how it happens. Yeah. Um, what is the first step in your personal world building process? Like you're about to start a new project in an entirely new world. How do you, how do you start it? Uh, I used to, I've, I've changed a lot over the years, the way I do it. I used to do more world building in advance with Elman of Fire, for example, I did got a lot of books from the library. And so I wanted to base it really closely on this historical time period. And so I was looking through things and reading and looking at costumes or not costumes, but actual clothing and portraits and so forth. And, um, you know, coming up with the finding ways to describe them and, and just working on descriptions of stuff and then looking up interesting buildings and stuff that I wanted to use. Um, now what I do, um, 
I kind of just launch into it. I've got a, a vision or a feel for how I want it to look um, to the reader. And I'll usually start with trying to work on the first scene. Sometimes that I talked in another podcast about trying to find the, the place to start and how difficult it can be. But um, I try to start working on that first scene and thinking about, you know, what's this going to look like? And I do a lot more of my world building uh, on the fly now as I go along. And that's because I've done a lot of research already on um, how uh, low technology cities work and, you know, um, and that kind of thing. So when I need to use that, I usually I either remember it or I know where to look for really quick for that information. So that's, it's not as important to do that research in advance. What I'm mostly looking, trying to get is the feel. And then as I go, I'll be like, okay, what well, they need to go in, I need a building. Uh, think of something really cool. And I'll look through, I'll uh, look through pictures. The Atlas Obscura is one thing I go to a lot because it's got a lot of pictures of interesting ruins and also interesting places. Um, and when you're looking for fantasy settings, strange rock formations or weird things like that are, are really good because you can kind of transform that into a building or a, a, a built place and make it a lot more cooler or interesting. Um, the, you know, you can look at so much architecture in, or, uh, of, from, you know, India and China and all through Asia and see these, these, uh, defensive fortifications that are so more interesting and so similar, but different to what we see in Europe and that kind of thing. It just gives you a lot of inspiration for how your fantasy buildings could look and, and just looking at stuff that you haven't seen before, um, which is kind of one of the um, things I talk to again, when I'm working with beginning writers is when you're trying to world build is uh, it needs to come out of, you need to have something that's uniquely you. It needs yeah. to be your imagination. Yeah. You don't want to do your research by reading someone else's novel, you know, <laughs> because you don't know what, <laughs> they came up with versus what was research and exactly. it's yeah. And you want it to be unique to your world and unique to you because when we deal with the same uh, tropes and um, um, ideas over and over again in science fiction and fantasy, you know, whether it's AI or, um, you know, world shattering you know, monsters or, or evil empires, all this kind of stuff. We deal with the same thing over and over again. And the thing that makes it special is you as the author and what you bring to it. So that has to be uh, present in your world building also. Yeah. And on this note of research is like, I, I love what you just said there. It's like, you take inspiration from things. And, and we, we talked to our friend, Jenny Dewis about this, where it's just like, her mind is just this, like, porous amalgamation of different things that she's absorbed over the course of her life. And, you know, the things that come out are not necessarily like an intentional reference to something else. It's like, this is the truest form of her creativity. And it just so happens that because she loved such and such thing, she absorbed some of it and, and it came out in her work in a way that was referential uh, and, and really cool for people who are a fan of that stuff as well. So for you, it's like, how do you know when to say like, okay, you've been talking about like architecture and, and uh, the sort of like look and feel of your world. But when it comes to like pulling from the real world, whether it's like architecture or history or events, how do you know where to kind of like draw that line in your own mind and your own process and say like, okay, that's enough. Now I need to rely more heavily on my own inspiration and my own creativity in order to you know, come up with something that, that I can sort of like flow with and not get bogged down and like, Oh, what are the technical details of blah, 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 blah. And then just let your creativity flow in a way that is natural. Um, well, I think it's, it really gets to, um, description where you really need to, you tell the reader what they need to know. Uh, you might know a lot more, 
uh, but you tell the reader what they need to know. And point of view, the point of view of your character, your character is not going to know everything there is to know about our world. It's like, I don't know everything there is to know about my house, let alone, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> the world I live in. So, and your characters are like that too. They'll know a lot about their own subject, um, but they won't know, um, know everything. And so uh, you don't need to tell the reader everything. <laughs> um, and it's kind of that when I'm world building on the fly, um, that's what I'm mostly concentrating on. What would this character know? What would they, what would they see? What would they notice? what would be important to them, especially if they're a non-human character that kind of changes all those variables. And you have to take that into account versus and what the reader needs to know to understand what's going on. And those are kind of really intertwined because you're, if you're writing from, you know, a close uh, point of view, then the reader, if the reader knows what the character knows, and sometimes you want to conceal stuff from the reader, but um right. You can do that. It gets into a whole other thing, but um, <laughs> yeah, does that make sense? I'm, yes, it's yeah. kind of a complicated. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a complicated little dance there. Um, it is, yeah. Uh, people also get into uh, one of the little problems is the "as you know, Bob" dialogue. They used to call that in <laughs> Turkey City, yes. where people talk about stuff they know, and it's like. You can you can have a character mention something and then you can close the sentence, you know the the quotation marks and just tell the reader what that meant. <laughs> it's right, like it's perfectly right. it's perfectly permissible, you know. Um, you don't have to have a <laughs> justify why the the narrator is telling the reader what this meant or whatever, so or what this word meant or what this thing is. I yeah. love it. I love it. Well, and you mentioned, so it is, it's a tangled web of everything. Well, I feel like all of novel creation <laughs> kind of becomes a, a big old uh, tangle yeah. of, of yarn that someone's cat got into. Um, so yeah. that's a good way I, to describe it. That, that's a very good <laughs> analogy. Thank you. As a person that has a crazy cat, maybe that's where Thorin, you uh, <laughs> I see you in the background. <laughs> is he in the background? He's somewhere. Yes, yes. Um, but I'm just curious, you know, uh, you've mentioned a little that, you know, your world building is kind of taking place on the fly at this point in these projects. Um, I'm curious as to how you keep all the details straight. Like I have so much trouble. I have like a big story Bible that I always make where I have to go back and reference and I still forget the name of cities and da 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 da. you know, um, do you have like tips, tricks, tools, anything you use to keep track of all of that stuff? I need something better because I, um, my memory used to be really good. And as you get older, it, that's not the case anymore. And so you start to notice stuff like that. But one thing I did with Witch King is whenever I named something, named a person, named a place, um, then, you know, said someone came from somewhere or something happened, I went and just copied it into a document. So I have this document was not in any kind of order, but it goes through and I can search on it and, and figure out these and remember these things. And I'm trying to remember where did I say that person came from or what did I say, you know? Um, and then when I was uh, working on the next novel, I was like, Oh, descriptions. I should have put descriptions in there too. Oh, no, right. Cause um, then you're like, Oh, what color were their eyes? And then you with, reference yeah. the wrong color and it's all. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Now, what about maps? Because that's what I always feel like for myself. I am not an artist. I am a very bad drawer, but I like to draw a map for myself. It's crappy and it's in Microsoft Paint and Adrian's giggling because mm-hmm. <laughs> in my terrible maps. <laughs> um, but I feel like it just helps give like sort of a spatial awareness, especially if your characters are traveling. I'm just yeah. curious if that's something you've utilized. Yeah, I did it um, um, actually for... I got to the the fourth book in the books of the Rexer and realized I I hadn't done a map because it was there. It was relatively simple up to that point. And I realized, Oh, I was going to need, I'm going to need a map. And so I had to search through the books and look for directions and stuff. So I could sort out where everything was. So that was fun. Um, I've got it up on the wall now because it was actually uh, used in a a university exhibit at uh, Cushing uh, Memorial Library and Archives and their science fiction fantasy collection. They do exhibits periodically and they did one on the maps of science fiction and fantasy, which is a beautiful exhibit. And my, 
my hand-drawn Rex Hera map got to be in it as an example oh of a hand-drawn author map. That is oh. so, so they, cool. It was really cool. And the map catalog is around um, in some places. And um, it was a great, they do great exhibitions there. If you ever get the chance to go to one, it's really nice. Um it's the lar- I think right now it's currently the largest science fiction and fantasy collection. Um, I think um, there's a, there's there's a couple of other big ones, but um, yeah, I hand draw it and then um, I did one for Witch King um, just to keep that because there's some travel in it, but there's a lot of references to where these places are, and so I wanted to kind of keep help keep things straight, and that's helped a lot. I have it up on. Um, my desk now to um, refer to and I wish I'd made it bigger because now I'm going to need more places and um, I'm just going to have to I'm not I'm not a map maker I'm not good at squishing the map and then adding Mm -hmm. stuff to it like they can do oh my gosh right yeah it's like I feel like I just need more bigger paper and it's like that's not really the solution you know it can be a solution yeah yeah well (laughs) Well, my, my dad was a my dad was a cartographer for the Canadian government, and so it's like I learned a lot about maps from him. And then the book that I'm writing now, it's like it takes place in a city, so I have the city map that I made. Oh, that's and cool! It's really, really helpful. But then, just like what you were talking about, I was like, I'm having fun with this, so I blew it up to like the country, and then I blew it up to the world because I'm like, fuck it, why not? <laughs> right, I'll just make the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why not, you know? I love. I had a, a fantasy maps. Um, book uh, that I used to get from the library and finally found a copy of it that had maps from all different, from different books and everything. It was totally, yeah. and I absolutely love that. I always liked looking at maps in fantasy. Yeah. Same. Yeah, me too. And so you, we talked about this a little bit um, in the last episode, but in terms of the, the way that you approach science fiction and fantasy, and, and you mentioned that you don't really differentiate them too much. It's kind of like you love these genres, you're going into them with the same sort of uh, intentions, but the way that the story and the characters necessitate different uses of technology or what have you. But when it comes to world building, how do you approach each individual novel or each individual project? And does your process evolve and change over the course of that? And then how might you approach world building from a science fictional perspective as opposed to a fantasy perspective? Um. Well, from a science fictional perspective with Murderbot, um, I knew uh, when I, uh, how repressive I wanted the corporation rim to be. And I was drawing from a lot of um, reality to create that. (laughs) Um, So, um, and also I wanted to stick to Murderbot's point of view because Murderbot doesn't really know how normal people live in that world it only really knows it when it started out it knows the places it's been the mining camps and the planetary surveys and the other places it's been sent and it knows that that space station that one it doesn't really know the station it knew that section the technical section where they work on the sec units and that's really all it knew so I'm exploring the world and building it from Murderbot's point of view. It knows a lot of things exist because it's seen them in its TV shows, basically. But it's it's a little dicey sometimes on what exists in a TV show and what exists in reality. And it knows that, like the whole idea. With, it's like, what's a forensic sweep? We know what it, it hears that word. You know, it's like, does it mean, you know, what is is that a real thing or, you know? <laughs> how much should we cover up this murder basically? Um, (laughs) So that was interesting because it was fun for me because I'm kind of learning the world along with the character and um, the space station walking scenes were basically based on airports for me in uh, that feeling of arriving at a unfamiliar airport and you're just lost. (laughs) You're just going through this place Uh, and there's a map and it's not really any good. And, you know, um, um, hoping you get to the place you need to be. Um, and 
that kind of feeling of alienation and liminal spaces. And that's a lot of what the world building in Murderbot is until you get to preservation and you're starting to see more, even they're still on a, more how normal and network effect also. And you're starting to see more normal um, living conditions for, for the humans. Um, so that's a completely different experience from a fantasy where you want to tell the reader or you show the reader um, um, a wider image of the world. And also with fantasy, I don't want the world to feel like there's any, well, you have to do this. It's the same kind of with science fiction that there's no boundary. One thing I really hated uh, reading when I was younger was books where let's say, Oh, uh, at the, you know, these mountains, no one knows what's, or this, this, oh. we don't know anything. We never go past these mountains. Right, and it's right. like they would, they didn't, I guess they didn't want to do any world building. So they would, they made it sound like the world was really small. And it's like, well, that's kind of boring. It's like, they know everything in this area. And it's like with fantasy, I want to feel like it's just limitless and there might be anything behind the, around the next corner, you know, and, um, um, so you're trying to give that there, I'm trying to give the feel to that re, to readers that this is a very developed world, but, um, you're only seeing little sections of it. You know, you're only seeing little bits and pieces of it that tell you. And hopefully what you want to give the impression of is these little bits and pieces indicate these whole other cultures and whole other existences outside the one that your character is currently moving through. Yeah. On that note, I, I wanted to ask you about like conveying information because I feel like in world building, the conveyance of information is so important in terms of like, you mentioned seeing the world of Murderbot through Murderbot's eyes and, and kind of letting the world flesh out bit by bit. Whereas in a fantasy, it's like sometimes you have a lot more information to give to the reader, but you don't necessarily want to info dump it on people. Oh, yeah. And I think exposition and info dumping is a big thing when it comes to world building because we talked about uh, at the beginning of this, uh, the the uh, older stories that like had like yeah. this little in disjointed introduction at the beginning. And that's kind of yeah. like, we're going to info dump this little bit of like reality on you just so you don't feel like, you know, this is, I don't know if you're going to feel like, how is this real? Like, I, I just, I just don't understand what's going on. But yeah. then a lot yeah. of old <laughs> fantasy, it's like prologues had a lot of info dumping. Um, or, you know, you said the, um, the bit about dialogue where it's just like, well, you know, Bob, it's like, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. So how do you kind of find that balance between like conveying information to readers without just like bombarding them at the same time? Well, it's tricky because usually you have a really, uh, you should, you should have a fairly developed idea of what stuff looks like and what your world's going, what's going on in your world and, and all the different things. But you literally can't just dump that information on the readers because unless there's an emotional connection to it, you're not going to remember that like these big prologues about, you know, the Lords of the whatever and the feet in the past. And people don't remember that because they have no intellectual, or I mean, emotional connection to that information. Um, it's, it's, so you really have to stick with, it's very tricky because you really have to stick with what the characters is going to be important to the character for what's their, what they're doing what they're going through and what the reader needs to know to understand that. And those two, those are two of the most important things. And um, like the old, the old school um, thing they used to make fun of all the time is the character stopping and looking themselves, looking at themselves in a mirror and yeah. describing yeah. themselves. Yeah. And um, I do that every that, day. No. Yeah. Everybody does that, you know, um, <laughs> Yeah, as opposed to the, you know, the past few years when we've been lucky to remember to put pants on before we go outside <laughs> to get the mail kind of thing. Um, so it's um, it's always fun for, or it's always good when I'm writing a book and I realize, oh, here's an opportunity. This is an important object. I can describe it because it's important to the scene. It's important to the character. Um, or when you're... Um, and you can, and there's little tricks to use. Like one of the, the ones I love best is the care. It's the book starts with the character going somewhere strange. And then that gives them an opportunity to describe all these things that they haven't seen before. 
Um, so there's various ways to do it. Um, but it's, it's really, you know, like you said, it's a tricky balance of, you know, you don't want to overload the reader with information. They're frankly not going to remember. Um, and you don't, and with the detail, um, the more, like there was an example uh, when I was in Turkey City and Bruce Sterling was critiquing my story. I had, you know, a mention of what the the roof of this very grand building the characters were in looked like. And I said it was a scene of Episcopal grandeur or something like that, something stupid. And he said, that doesn't mean anything. That, But this other here where you said that you gave the detail of something of – you know, how sharp this thing was or whatever, that was a picture that formed a picture in your brain. This, these words, Episcopal grandeur, that doesn't tell you really any of it's vague. It doesn't tell you things. So the more specific you can be with one detail and people's imagination can kind of take over the rest. So it's just, uh, and I did when I was first starting to write, I did a lot of practice with description. I would read books and, kind of analyze my favorite books, how they describe things. I would analyze that. I would copy it. I would come up with stuff, you know, and then objects and describe them. I have like reams of that. So it's not, it's like, it takes a lot of work, I think, to get to that point. Um, so if people can't, aren't born knowing how to do it, it's not exactly, you know, it's not an innate thing. It's something that you really have to work on. Um, especially in fantasy and, um, uh, gosh, a while back, I can't remember how long ago this was. It was a while back. There was, you know, you would go, I went on like two or three different panels at two or three different conventions in a row and people are saying fantasy shouldn't have any description. And now I thought that was dumb. Um, <laughs> because dumb. <laughs> if there's no description, I'm imagining characters naked in a white room. Yeah. <laughs> right. And it's like, because, you know, in old school science fiction, I would read sometimes they wouldn't have a lot of description, especially in the science fiction. And I'm just like, are they naked? You know, <laughs> that's what I would be imagining yeah. because there was no like there was no indication, not even like she straightened her shirt cuff or something to tell you if this person was even wearing clothes. And so it was <laughs> like you're sort of starting with a blank slate there. New um, white room syndrome. <laughs> white room yeah. syndrome. Talking heads in a white room with no clothes. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Kate Elliott did a great um, essay. I think it was, she, I think that might've been posted on tour.com about how that is really, it, it's, it's kind of reactionary to say there should be no description because if there's no description, we're going to default to what we think of fantasy, like faux medieval England. Um, and um, Lord of the Rings, which actually doesn't look very much like faux medieval England, as you saw in the movies, it looks very beautiful and very, it's very, it's very, and we see the, the material culture they created for each one of those different, the elves and the humans and everything. It's all very different and very kind of unique um, that you need to, that you, that what you're basically doing is genericizing everything and all the people you want, uh, basically a, you know, a European based, uh, generic faux middle ages is what you're asking people to default to in their mind, as opposed to, um, allowing readers, especially, um, um, there's different, there's, different uh, uh, traditions of writing and, and doing fantasy in different cultures where these things are really important. So what you're doing is telling those people, no, we don't want that. We want, you know, our very narrow definition. So right. um, we want the one uh, that sells. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't allow that we think sells. Yeah. exactly. Uh, it, do there, it doesn't allow um, for any kind of, of, um, let alone individual expression, but a cultural expression of different storytelling methods. Um, um, so, yeah, so <laughs> that was dumb. You know, it was just, and, 
I, Fant- I can go fantasy, on and on about how dumb fantasy, that was, but I'll yeah, stop Fantasy myself. needs description. That's bullshit. <laughs> fantasy, yeah, yeah. Fantasy needs needs description. Um, everything kind of needs description everything again, does, unless you're yeah. writing yeah, about say. naked people in a white room. But so. even in that case, you could tell us that, and that gives you us could tell us that, <laughs> yeah. and that would be a big impact. Yeah. And we'd so. be like, tell "Whoa, me, why like, are how, they naked? How, why is yeah, this room white?" Like, <laughs> it reminds cold, me of how cold is it on his like naked skin? Like, tell me. About yeah, that. it's cold. <laughs> like THX one one three eight, where they didn't have any money, and so there's a lot of just bare rooms. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that that's. I think that was George Lucas's first movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. If you if you don't want any description, then go look at that movie and you see what you would get. <laughs> you see yeah. what you've created. It's just, and then ooh. and then look at Star Wars and see what. And then what look at Star Emperor Wars. <laughs> yeah. I love that. So, uh, I love that. So world building is a huge effort. <laughs> um, I'm curious about <laughs> your favorite and least favorite parts of the process. So, for, for example, my least favorite part of the process is naming shit. I have to name everything, and I hate that because you don't <laughs> – Adrian's laughing at me, yeah. but it's like you don't realize how many things – oh, these characters, they came across I the river. I love naming shit. God and, uh, damn it. Now I have I to name the river. <laughs> yeah. That's so I'm curious. Too. Yeah. Yeah. See, Adrian. That's it. All right. <laughs> after, especially after I've been writing Murderbot for a while, I was talking, actually I was talking to Kate Elliott in a Zoom and I was like, I forgot writing fantasy. I have to name all this shit. But it's like, <laughs> you know, here we are again. Just to describe anything, all these things have to have names and they have to have good names that sound right. <laughs> and it's just like, oh my God, I forgot so what this much. was like. <laughs> and then sometimes you'll come up with a really good name. Yeah. And then all the other names will not look good anymore. And it's like, I mean, you go these. Them again. Yeah. <laughs> no. It just sounds, now this sounds dumb and I have to fix it because this other one is so good. <laughs> what's, so, a, yeah. what, what's a favorite thing though, compared to like the chore of naming things for you? <laughs> the favorite thing is really just um, coming up with something that just feels cool and it feels right. And it gives you, and it feels like, man, I, this is really working. This is really, it's really, it's like vibing with the character and the world and what I'm trying to do and those little details that just make it. And you can drop it in and it just really sets the scene. Okay. And there's one, I had a problem with one in the books of the Rex are, uh, um, I had a scene where Moon and Jade were sitting there talking after they'd been flying for a while. And there was these little mushroom like things that when they sat there and sat down, they got the little mushroom things got up and walked away. And I love that. I love that. And then I ended up needing to take out that scene because it was, it, it didn't fit there and I needed to take that conversation, put it further back and do something else with it. And so I had this little like, a line and a half describing the mushroom people. And I looked all over that book for a place to put it <laughs> because it's like, this is perfect. Right. It fits the world, but I need somebody, some place to put, I can't remember if I ever got it in there and actually, or I actually moved it to the next book, but little things like that. And it just sort of gives the people, it gives the reader a, an impression of what that world is like that, not only how different the the plants and animals are, but how ubiquitous um, life is. And, you know, it's like, is this, are these things sentient? Are these just little, little mushrooms that can move? Are these people under there? They might be, you don't know. And, and kind of something that is, is you're defining your world in these tiny little bits, even something as simple as instead of saying, you know, a cat at a mouse hole, you say a cat at a lizard hole, you know, that gives you a different view of what the world is like. Because in our house, it's like, well, it's a lot more likely to be a lizard. Mm -hmm. Um, The number of lizards I've extracted out of cats' mouths, you know, (laughs) it's just (laughs) trying to save it. um, But yeah, just stuff like that. Those little, little details that really do help define the world and give the reader the feeling that yes, they are in a different world and not just, um, you know, a, 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 a kind of slap together version of our world. 
100%. And you're speaking to my heart. MJ looked at me. I know she did. I know. brought up mushroom people. <laughs> Adrian ra- loves mushrooms. Yeah. I love mushrooms, but I'm also writing a book with mushroom people, even though it's oh, sci-fi. Yeah. Cool. So it's still like, I'm just like, oh, hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're speaking my language now. <laughs> speaking my language. All right. Well, um, just to kind of wind things down, I wanted to touch on, very briefly, terminology. Uh, Stephen King has a... Uh, you know, made made a bit of a, a stir on on Twitter about the terminology of world building and all that crap. But I'm curious from your perspective. <laughs> I like the term world building, and it works for me. But do you yeah. find that it's useful for writers, even though it includes such a wide breadth of craft and creativity? Um, I think it is useful because it's like it's something. I mean, we have to use language that people understand. And we could make up a lot of very sophisticated sounding words for things, uh, but, you know, who would know what we meant at this point? You know, it's like, um, it's like, um, it's, it's kind of like changing the name of world building is kind of like bad world building. Like <laughs> yeah. you're, you're taking ordinary things and calling them by elaborate names when it's still just like a table, you know? So just call it a table and then everyone knows what you mean and you can fancy it up some other way. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, under, I don't even really understand what he's talking about. It's like what Bruce <laughs> Sterling told you about the, about the, you know, that, that like description is like, this doesn't make any sense. It's like, that doesn't, that doesn't put anything. It doesn't clear add in anything. Head. Yeah. It doesn't add anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the, the, the specific detail is what you want. Yeah. So, uh, when I say world building, everyone knows, oh, my setting and uh, my culture uh, that I'm building, that I'm, I'm, I'm going to create and my, uh, my environment, you know, that kind of thing. Especially with science fiction, when you might be creating an entire planet yeah. you know, that you have to yeah. then, like, uh, I'm thinking of Charlie Jane Anders had that book where- The City in the Middle was, of the Night. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. And so the the physical um, reality of that planet was very important to the story. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, and everyone knows that's world building. That's what world building You're is. Building a world. So, yeah. Shut up, Stephen yeah. King. Sorry. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> basically. I love that, and I love mm. how the changing the term is bad world building. Like for reality, I'm going to use that. Like if someone says, oh, it doesn't make sense. That's terrible world building. And they're yeah. you know what I mean? It's going to be and amazing. they're not a writer. So they're just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, oh, okay. I'm going to leave this girl alone. Uh, <laughs> so I'm curious to wrap things up and kind of bring it all together. Do you have a final piece of advice that you would offer to other writers out there that are looking to improve their world building processes? Um, I think just, um, Looking at uh, books and movies, even in TV, where you enjoyed the world, the the atmosphere, the world building, and think, well, how did they do that? And there's even been, you know, TV shows that weren't quite so good, but somewhere there was a set designer who was fucking brilliant and came up with this gorgeous stuff. And so you have a not great show being enacted with what looks like an entirely invented um, material culture and reality and fantasy reality, you know, and you see stuff like that all the time. So kind of look at the, pay attention to those details. And a lot of times when you see something like that, it'll be really consistent and they'll have, you know, when you hear about people who are really good costume and set designers and, and do that kind of thing, um, they'll talk like a, there's a great, uh, uh, um, what do they call it? A, like a little non uh, documentary about the making of Wakanda forever with the designers and everything. And they're talking about the different sections of Wakanda and stuff that you didn't even notice in the movie, but really added to that feeling of reality and how each of those sections are derived from a different source and they have different, um, different, colors and different culture and different, different methods of doing things, you know, different clothes and, and how the styles and everything and, and how they put that together. Um, just looking at those, those documentaries and there's a bunch of documentaries for the Lord of the Rings that were on the DVDs that talked about all their material culture and even seeing that exhibit, having the chance to see that exhibit, I think really helped me is how, how 
tiny some of the details were. Um, but just looking at that kind of stuff, and it's like if you like, you know, you like the world building on something, is kind of study it and see if you can pull out what what really meant something to you, and think about how that person came up with that, and, and what was the what was really cool about it, and what really got your attention. Well, that is a perfect note to end on. Yeah, the, Love that. if anyone likes Lord of the Rings, go watch the extra features because they go into like the making yeah. of the armor, the jewelry, the sets. All of it is so fascinating and so, like you said, like minute in the details. Yeah. But everything done and crafted with care. And I think when it comes to stories, craft it with care and craft it in a way that is true to you. And that is it for our mini masterclass and our two-parter with Martha. Thank you so much for taking the time to impart your worldly knowledge about this topic uh, and if you could let everyone know where they can find you on social media. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed it. Um, and you got, you guys asked such good questions. Um, I'm on MarthaWells.com and uh, um, there's links to my other, I have a blog on dream with that's linked to from there. And that also that blog gets, gets um, transferred to Goodreads. Um, um, so you can see me, see my, my posts, my infrequent posts on there. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And you can also follow SFF Addicts on Instagram and Twitter at SFF Addicts Pod, or you can follow me at Adrian M. Gibson. MJ, where can people find you? Yep. Uh, you can find me across all major socials, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, at MJ Coon Books, all one word. Fantastic. Now, keep reading, keep imagining, and we'll see you next time on SFF Addicts.